movie. The movie is spectacular as well, in my opinion. The movie stars, stars Gregory Peck as Atticus Finch, the morally upright Southern attorney, widowed father of Scout and Jim. And there's a pretty famous part of that story where Atticus teaches a lesson about interpersonal relationships to Scout after a, a tough day at school. And the quote reads, if you can learn a simple trick, Scout, you'll get along better with all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. I think Scout was about eight or nine years old at this point in the story. And so that might have been a little hard for her to understand what her dad was talking about. But we hear that. And I think we can see that Atticus was talking about compassion. Compassion is what I think that whole book's about. And it's interesting that you focused on compassion in your Lord's Supper talk, brother, because compassion is what I want to focus on this morning with the rest of our time together. But what is compassion? More importantly to us as Christians, what is compassion? What does compassion mean to Christians? Well, if you were to look at the definition in binds, you'd find something along these lines, to have pity through the ills of others, to be moved with mercy for others. So it seems to me that compassion is not really about anything having to do with me necessarily. I don't have a problem, you have a problem. But because I can see your problem, because I can understand what you're going through, I feel sadness, I feel pity, I'm moved to action, I'm moved to wanna to help you. And we have numerous examples of compassion in the Bible, don't we? Dan mentioned one. If I were to ask 100 Christians to name their best example of compassion in the Bible, we'd all say Jesus first, right? But a close second might be the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that'd be right. That'd be an excellent answer. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a great example of compassion. And that type of compassion that is shown by the Samaritan is a very important component to living a Christian life. But this isn't gonna be a lesson about the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't think I need to focus on that parable this morning because that kind of compassion involves seeing someone with an obvious need, right? Very obvious that the traveler on the side of the road was in trouble and needed help. And I don't think this family here, this congregation needs a lesson on that. I believe everyone here is more than willing to help someone who's in obvious need. In fact, I don't just believe that. I know it to be true. I've seen it. In numerous examples with this congregation. But there's another aspect of compassion I want to focus on today, and it's what Atticus was talking about. Right? It's the idea of being willing to consider things from the point of view of someone else even if, and perhaps especially if, we don't agree with that person. So as we think about this, I want us to first think about societal things, worldly issues, dare I say the politics word, things of that nature that, that cause us to disagree. You know, our, our culture, especially in this country, maybe the world, I don't know, but for sure here, we really like to fight. I don't say we like to argue. I don't say we like to debate because that would indicate a fair exchange of ideas. That's not what we do. We don't do that. We don't debate. We fight. We want to completely smash and obliterate, render into submission someone that disagrees with us. We don't want to hear what they think about it if we disagree with them. And that type of attitude has caused division in our country. Not that division necessarily is anything new, but the division that exists now is bitter. It's deeply entrenched because of this attitude that the thought process seems to be, if you're on the other side of an issue for me, well, you're wrong, but you're not just wrong. You're narrow, you're stupid, you're vile, you're evil. 
that how we feel sometimes? We disagree with somebody? Probably so. We're being honest. Maybe not all those things. Some of them. And that happens. Maybe we can't control that. But the important question is, do we let feeling like that, do we let disagreements over issues like that prevent us from spreading the gospel? Does having that type of anger, that wanting to be right, that wanting to completely disassociate from someone you disagree with, does that make you an ineffective spreader of the gospel? Of course it would. Do you allow it to? So as we think about that, as we think about these groups, these categories, these parties, these affiliations, these things that divide us, and we think about how that affects us in being effective spreaders of the gospels, perhaps we should consider some biblical examples of these types of things. Let's consider Matthew, the Apostle Matthew. Matthew, of course, one of the 12 handpicked by Jesus. What was Matthew's profession? What was his background? What was his affiliation? The tax collector, right? Many of us know that. Now, as I talk about division disagreements, one thing we probably can all agree on is that most of us don't love paying taxes. And we might not necessarily be warm and fuzzy feeling about the IRS, but it's nothing compared to the hatred and the feeling that devout Jews of the first century had toward tax collectors. They believed that only God was worthy of financial tribute and to pay taxes to a government was against their beliefs. So in the eyes of most Jews, for Matthew to have been a Jew and also been a tax collector, he would have been considered a traitor, not just to his people, but to his God. So here we have this traitorous tax collector that Jesus chooses to be one of the 12. Why? I don't know why. But I can pose at least one theory that it's possible that he was teaching the apostles then, and doing so teaching us still now, that maybe we shouldn't be so quick to judge or cast out someone because of their background, affiliations, even their job. We can also consider Paul. Paul was certainly an enemy of the early church. By his own hand in Galatians 1.13 says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. He directly persecuted Christians with great zeal. Yet he was still chosen. And you think, how did the other apostles feel about that? How did other Christians, how did disciples feel about that? Well, we know from Acts 9.26 and 27, at least one occasion when they were afraid of him didn't necessarily want him to be brought into their midst. It took the encouragement of Barnabas. It took Barnabas vouching for him to allow that to happen. Now, in the case of Matthew and Paul, they both changed. They changed, left their previous lives behind when they followed Christ, just as we all must do. But what if they hadn't ever been given the chance to do that? What if they didn't listen to Barnabas and accept his encouragement? What if, despite the endorsement of Jesus, the other apostles just couldn't accept Matthew? What if they'd been rejected? Are there people or certain types of people, perhaps, that because of their societal views, their affiliations, even professions, we might not be too eager to talk to about Jesus? Wouldn't we be better servants of Christ if we took the time to understand their point of view? Understand why they feel the way they feel. Understand why they think what they think. After all, we want them to understand our point of view, don't we? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 19. It says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. 
For the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, although not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. You have to be willing to be flexible, as indicated in the scripture here. We have to be willing to listen. We want people to listen to us. We want people to hear the message that we know is true and good and righteous and will save them, but we want them to hear it. Why would they listen to us if we won't listen to them? Why would you want to consider my point of view if I'm not willing to consider yours? You wouldn't. You wouldn't. So we have to be willing to listen to them. Now that's in our relationship with people outside the household of faith primarily is what I'm focused on there. But what about here? What about among our brethren? And these same things cause us to be divided and these same issues and differences of opinion, societal matters divide us. Do we avoid certain people because of their political beliefs or what we perceive to be their beliefs or maybe they're and we disagree on COVID protocols or vaccines, tons of things we could pick. Do we avoid them because of that? Do we treat them differently? Scripture teaches us to have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind, 1 Peter 3.8. Can we do that if we're not willing to consider the point of view of our own brother or sister in Christ? Now, listen, I struggle with this. I've got a problem right now. I have a very hard time dealing with the fact that Eddie is a Louisville fan. I do, Dan. I've, I've, I've tried to consider his point of view. I've really thought about it. And I've come to the conclusion you're just wrong. And you're misguided. Silly example. Obviously hoping to get a little bit of a chuckle on that. Glad most of you are still with me. But while silly, it brings up an important point here. Okay, considering someone else's point of view, I'm not saying we're going to have to agree. Eddie and I could talk the rest of the afternoon about our favorite sports teams. At the end of that, I'm pretty sure he's not going to be a Kentucky fan. I know I'm not going to be a Louisville fan. So we can talk about it. We can reason. We can disagree without being disagreeable. That applies to my silly example. It applies to much more serious matters as well, if we're willing to listen. So what if it's not a societal issue? What if it's not a secular issue? What if it's scriptural? What if it's doctrinal? It's a little harder. How do we handle that? Well, as always, in all things, scripture provides direction. Please turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, beginning verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Now, this scripture is teaching us about disagreements or doctrinal issues personal choice, and it's teaching us not to judge, it's teaching us not to quarrel over these things. Now, let me pause here for a minute. I'm not suggesting that everything is open to debate. I'm not suggesting that everything is to be tolerated. We have clear commandments from God in Scripture. We have clear examples from God in Scripture that we can turn to, we can read, and it's black and white. Now I'll still suggest we need to listen to people on that and calmly discuss, but at the end of that, there's no gray area with these things. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2.38. Do this in remembrance of me, Luke 22, 
19. These must stand on their own. So that's not what I'm, what I'm talking about, but there are many, many others for which we don't have a clear command, right? We don't have a clear example. These are matters of personal conviction, matters of personal belief, matters of conscience. So they're important. They're a very big deal. If they weren't, they wouldn't cause people to feel so strongly about them and, and fall out over. And the list can be quite lengthy. I know of a brother that started writing them down and stopped when he got to about 115. So there's plenty of these things. Just for example, talking about things like, what kind of clothes are we supposed to wear when we come together? Is it okay to dance? Is it bad to dance? Without offering the Lord's Supper, we're supposed to do it once or twice. We're supposed to do it in the morning, we're supposed to do it in the evening. What kind of cup should we use? What kind of bread should we use? Military service, being a policeman, on and on and on. These are things that brethren fall out over. But they're not discussions that allow us to go to the scripture and find a clear answer. And so we very often can't come to an agreement on them. And so when dealing with disagreements on these matters, whether amongst ourselves or with those outside of this congregational family, we must remember the direction given by Paul here in Romans 14, not to quarrel, not to judge. And we have other scriptures as well that I believe can help us in this area. Let's turn to Ephesians 4, please. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Turn with me also to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, we'll begin in verse 2. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. If we're not at least willing to consider the point of view of our brother and hear him or her out, how can we say that we're counting others more significant than ourselves? Can we say that we're showing humility, gentleness, and patience? So maybe right now you're wondering, why is he preaching about this? Maybe not, but if you are, you might be wondering, why is this so important? Why does he think our congregation needs to hear this? Well, I can tell you that I did not choose this topic because of any situation within our church family here. You know, sometimes I hear Dempsey preach a lesson and on something I'm thinking, I wonder if something's happening that's made him preach on this. That, that's not the case, okay? I don't feel like our congregation is struggling in this area. I don't feel like we need to make marked improvement in this area. But I do believe that this is a massive problem in our society. Massive. We've lost the desire for empathy completely. I say we, I mean, obviously in general. We're not supposed to look like society, are we? We're supposed to look different, but that's hard. And so as this becomes more and more prevalent in our society, as this attitude of I'm right, you're terrible, begins to be more pervasive, we need to be on guard not to let that creep in among us here. The other thing is we're a growing congregation. Praise God for that. Lord willing, we'll continue to grow. More people means more ideas, more ideas that will help us serve the Lord and grow together. But it's human nature. More ideas also means more potential for disagreement. It just does. So as we grow together in the Lord, let's remember to show our love for each other by being patient, and being willing to listen. Through love, serve one another. Galatians 5.13. That's the direction from our Lord. It's also 
the focus our eldership has chosen for the upcoming year. Through love, serve one another. Again, Galatians 5.13. I submit to you that in order to do that, we must also seek to understand each other. As with all things that are good and holy, Jesus provides the greatest example. If you're still in Philippians, turn back there, go to verse five, rather, Philippians two, verse five. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus left the Lord's side. He left heaven and came here and lived as a mortal. He literally walked around in our skin. In doing so, he's able to know and feel and understand what we are, what we go through. See, having compassion requires understanding someone's situation. It requires understanding their point of view. And sometimes that's very easy to do. In the case of the Good Samaritan, here's a man laying on the ground who's clearly been beaten. He's clearly injured. He's been robbed. I don't need to ask a whole lot of questions to know what that man needs or to be compassionate toward him, but it's, it's not always that obvious. In fact, rarely is it that obvious. To show true compassion, we have to be willing to listen and to understand, and there begins the path of forgiveness. Jesus' willingness to live as a man and feel what we feel, understand our point of view, was a crucial part of God's amazing plan of salvation. And so if we are to be Christ-like, we must strive to do the same thing. I appreciate your kind attention this morning. Our brother's about to lead us in a song of encouragement. As we sing, if there's anyone here that wants to be part of that plan of salvation, that wants to be baptized for forgiveness of your sins, I'd encourage you to come forward when we sing. If there's anyone here that has a question about my lesson, or has a question about how to become a Christian, you can come forward while we sing, or if you're not comfortable doing that, please seek one of us out after the service. We would love to hear your point of view. We would love to listen to you. And then together we'll go to the scriptures and read about how we serve our God. Let's all stand as we sing the song of encouragement. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, to gain by a further delay? There's no one to save you but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There's danger and death in delay. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why?
We'd all like to thank Joe for that thoughtful lesson today. I know he probably put in a lot of work and we really appreciated it.